thanks a lot for the introduction and um, thanks a lot for being here with me and joining this session. So yeah, you um, have figured out I am uh, not Jamak, but as Jamak, I am working as a consultant with ThoughtWorks. Uh, specifically, I work with ThoughtWorks Germany, where I'm leading the machine learning and data engineering community. And actually, over the, la over the course of the last year, I worked with Jamak on a couple of data mesh topics. Um, so when she asked me to jump in, I was uh, more than happy to do this. So the name of the talk is Data Mesh, a Paradigm Shift in Data Architecture. So let's see. Of course, this is not working now. Well, there we go. So I'm sure all of you have heard the term paradigm shift before, right? I mean, it's being used uh, quite a lot. But who of you know where the term actually originates from? Maybe a raise of hands, anyone? No one, all right. Um, I also didn't know it uh, a while ago. So um, the term was actually coined by Thomas Kuhn in his 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And Thomas Kuhn, he was an American physicist, um, but then became kind of a uh, scientific philosopher. And he came up with this model of how scientific revolutions work. And, uh, and this model describes kind of four phases. And the first of those phases is what he calls normal science. And in this normal science phase, people and scientists, they basically work within the, the boundaries of their current way of thinking. They basically prove what they expect to see. They refine the current models, they sharpen them, but there's not so much critical thinking going on. And then the second phase he describes is where first anomalies start to appear. So you start to observe things that cannot be easily explained with the current models and with the current way of thinking. So there's already a bit of a tension coming up here. And then when those anomalies um, become more and more frequent, then this leads to the third phase, which is the crisis phase. And in this crisis phase, um, basically, you start doubting um, whether the whole models that you have and the whole way of thinking, whether it is actually correct and whether it makes sense. And this questioning and really questioning everything there is what leads to revolutionary science and coming up with entirely new ideas. So basically, from incremental improvements on the left side, we come to an entirely new order on the right side here. So now, why am I telling you this here? We think that there is a crisis in data, in the usage of data, in organizations, and in data architecture. And when we look at investments that are being made by companies into big data and AI, then we see that those investments are growing year over year. And those are numbers um, from a survey where leaders of the Fortune 1000 uh, companies were asked about their big data and AI investments. And we see they're growing quite considerably, actually. But at the same time, those same leaders um, when they are asked about their confidence um, that those investments will yield actual business results, then they become less and less confident every year. So basically, what we see is that there are 
exceptions to this, of course. Like um, you have those great examples, spe specifically of the big players building amazing things with um, AI and um, making great big data architectures um, and applications. But really, when we look at the industry as a whole and also the clients that we interact with, um, we have to say that most of them fail specifically when it comes to transformational measures. That means to create a data-driven culture, to treat data as business assets, and to ultimately to beat the competition using data and analytics. So why is that so? For this, let's have a look at how the current landscape and thinking about um, data technology solutions looks like today. And when we look at the current state, and to a certain extent also the current accepted norm, then we see that there is quite a big divide between operational systems architecture and big data analytical architecture. The operational systems architecture on the left, this is where the business is running, where capabilities and services are provided, where the operational data lives, and where products and applications are being built. And this side is really where we were successfully applying microservice architectures, DevOps, where domain-driven design um, is really successful being applied. And on the right side, the big data analytic architect architecture, this is where the business is being optimized, where insights are being generated, and where the analytic analytical data is living, and also where machine learning models are being built. And when we look at those two sites, then we see that there is really quite, quite a divide in terms of technology, in terms of skill set and capabilities, and also in terms of how those two sites are being approached um, from an architectural standpoint. So when we look at the right side, at the big data analytic architecture, then we can somehow say that, we're, that there were three or maybe two and a half generations of approaches so far. The first approach was that of a data warehouse. Anyone has an idea how long data warehouses are around or kind of when the first data warehouse came around? Any, any guesses? What do you say? Close. It actually already dates back into the 70s. So it's actually more than 40 years now. So um, they are around for a really long time now. And then about 2010, the data lake approach um, came about. Um, and then in the last 10 years, we kind of moved that data lake approach to cloud technologies and to cloud providers. So this is kind of the, the latest iteration of this. So now let's have a look what the data lake approach actually set out to solve. So when we look at the data warehouse approach here, then we can say that the data warehouse approach is about extracting data from many sources and transforming them into one single schema, because it's usually a curated data warehouse. Load the data into this warehouse, and then data analysts, so actual humans, are doing analysis on this warehouse, and they create BI reports and dashboards. And now, the issue with this setup is that when the number of data sources I think you can't see that. Um, so on the right upper side, when the number of data sources is growing rapidly, then this step of bringing all this different um, heterogeneous data into one single schema becomes a bottleneck. So this is really where this model doesn't scale. And this is what the data lake approach um, was meant to solve. And when we look at the data lake approach, um, it starts with the same thing. Data is extracted from many sources, but those can actually be now far more um, different sources because you simply load the data more or less as is into your data lake. 
So thereby, you kind of remove that bottleneck of squeezing everything into one single schema. But then you actually have the bottleneck, in a certain sense, on another side, because you still have to make the data usable in a certain way. So you create those lakeshore marts on the right downside um, that transform the data to be useful for a certain application. And this is where the data scientists work, but also application developers, and they build machine learning models, they build data-driven applications. But really, what we have moved is we moved this bottleneck from the ingestion side to the serving side, to a certain extent. And it is really nothing unusual for me to hear that data scientists, they spend easily 80% of their time finding where the data actually is, cleaning it, and um, just bringing it to the state where it actually can be used, so not even generating insights yet. And this is really what shows that um, this work has just been moved um, to another place here. And when we look at the technologies that are being used, um, and I'm actually not endorsing any of those here, um, but you see that kind of the, the different generations here, they have their distinct tool set, their distinct technology. So when we look at the data warehouse approach, um, there's Power BI, there's Tableau, there's Teradata. And um, when we look at the data lake approach, we have obviously the cloud storage, um, we have Spark, Hadoop, and um, Airflow. So we have kind of, to a certain extent, a uh, distinct um, technology tool set or tool chain here for the different approaches. <clears throat> and then this latest iteration where we move the data lake into the cloud, this is ju then just using all those um, actually fantastic cloud technologies, cloud services. And this year, this is an example um, pretty much from the documentation of uh, GCP, the Google Cloud Platform, how to build a data lake on the cloud there. And you see here in the middle, um, there is this cloud storage right in the middle. And on the left side, you see there are different sources, sensor data, uh, user activity, and so on. You might have batch uh, processing data as well. And it all goes into the central data lake cloud storage. And then from there, it branches out again to the different use cases. And if you look at any of the other cloud providers and what they suggest how to build it, it looks very similar. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like Those cloud providers, they provide fantastic services and tools to build this. So this does look convincing somehow, right? But then why is it actually not working, as we saw by the numbers earlier? So one of the reasons that we see for this is centralization. Because when you look at this from a bit afar, when you really step back, then all those solutions pretty much look like this. It's always the same. You have the sources that are being ingested on the left side. You have this big data platform in the middle. And then you have the consumers to which the data is served on the right side. And it is really amazing how often I've already heard someone saying, like, ah, let's just fix this problem with the data by bringing all the data in one central place, right? Kind of fixing, fixing this thing that we have inconsistent data. Let's just bring it in one central place, and then the problem will be solved. Well, unfortunately, this doesn't really work like this. And more importantly, where are the domain boundaries, right? I mean, I'm here at a DDD conference, so um, you're all aware of how important it is to look where the domains are and where the boundaries of those domains are. And we have been, or we apply domain-driven design so much on the operational side of things. But, and then we build cross-functional teams that build uh, services, own those services, and so on. But then when it comes to this analytical data architecture, we are basically building this good old gigant, gigant, gigantic monolith here. And we kind of squeeze all the different uh, domains in this monolith, and we have the 
kind of parts of the orders um, and the customer's uh, domain in here. But of course, it's not the entire domain because parts of those domains also live on the producing side and parts of this live on the consuming side. So really, this nice little rectangle box that we uh, were drawing here for the data platform, it really goes through the domain boundaries. And if we look, so instead of those nice domain boundaries, what we see when we look a little bit closer and when we kind of, when I, when I come on a project and I ask any data engineer or data architect to describe me their data architecture, then pretty much in 90% of the cases, something like this is being described and being put on a whiteboard. There's this ingest phase, there's the process phase, and then there's the serve stage. Um, and there are no, no domains, but there's this separation pretty much by technology because it takes different tools and different technologies for those different steps. So basically, we're seeing a separation by technology here. And I'm sure you have seen this separation by technology before. So when you actually tilt your head a little bit and we flip this around, then this is the good old layered application architecture um, that we have been trying to get rid of for so long now, where you have the business logic in the middle, you have the UI on top and the data uh, um, solutions on the bottom, and you kind of divide them by technology. And this is really what we want to get away from and what we are working on and partly quite successfully on the operational side, that we build teams that, working, that are working cross-functionally and they work across those layers. Um, that's, we often call it vertical slices, kind of small slices that go through all of those layers and have an ownership. And there are good reasons for pushing for um, uh, or against this technical uh, the separation by technologies. And those reasons are both true for uh, application design in the operational space, but also for um, data architecture. And the reason is that the separation by technology is orthogonal to the axis of change. That means when we want to change something, when we want to introduce, for instance, a new data feature, a new data capability, then we usually have to touch all three places, right? And therefore, this creates a lot of friction, and it gives us an idea that this is actually the wrong separation. And the situation that we end up, and that I have seen um, again and again, is this here. We have the teams that are building the operational systems on the left side, and they're kind of happy. I mean, they have their own uh, problems and incentives, but they are building the applications, they make them work reliably, and <clears throat> they uh, generate a lot of data. And on the right side, we have the consumers of data, data scientists, BI teams, and they are actually not so happy because they're often facing um, yeah, suboptimal data quality, um, not so good reliability and so on. But then the poorest of them all, they are really the data platform engineers in the middle. And they are really in a tough spot. So with this setup, they sit in the middle and they have no idea of the domain that they are dealing with from the data producing side. And at the same time, they're also fairly disconnected to the consuming side. So I have been working in those teams um, several times, and it is really quite a struggle. So in those teams, what I mostly see is constant firefighting, um, and those teams are being perceived as a bottleneck that is slowing everything down, so they are really having a hard time. And in those teams, you're all the time you're fixing issues that have been introduced by people in the operational um, systems teams, and 
you're fixing things that you are not even an expert about. So you don't even know what this is about that has been changed there. And the, um, the, the people in the uh, operational systems teams, I mean, they are not, not bad people. They just kind of, they have no connection. They don't know what is happening with this. So they maybe just change something. And um, then the people in the data platform uh, team, they need to deal with it. And even worse, they feel disconnected from the, um, from the BI and data scientist side. So they don't even know what the business impact is of what they are doing. So they are basically working hard, not knowing what this is they are fixing and not knowing what the value is of fixing it, which is not exactly um, a good motivational position. So why would we even do this, right? Do such a organizational setup? Well, has any of you been involved in hiring a data engineer recently? Believe me, it is really tough. Like, it is so hard to hire data engineers. Um, and because it is so hard to get those few people, because it is quite a specialized technology domain, right? Kind of you, it, it's not so easy to find the people that really have the skill set and the experience to work with those tools. So it might sound like a good idea to take those few people that you manage to hire in that space and put them in this hyper-specialized silo to make sure you're really getting the best out of them and the whole company can benefit from their skill set. Well, unfortunately, this is, as we all know, not a really good idea. Because we have those, we already do those cross-functional teams on the operational side, and we try to do those cross-functional teams on the consuming side of things. And in the middle, when we have this hyper-specialized team, it actually makes things even worse. Because there is not so much knowledge sharing with the other teams, um, so yeah, kind of the silo becomes even more a silo. Um, and also there is a lack of empathy, which is often the, the main issue. Like, um, the different parties, they do not know how much the other side is suffering. And so this reminds us, uh, reminds us of, of something, right? It's the situation before DevOps was introduced. It's very similar to that situation where the developers were throwing over their code to the operations folks uh, and not thinking too much of the problems of the other side. And it makes so much sense to bring down that wall between developers and operations, and we have been really successful with this, and we've proven that this makes sense to bring that wall down, and we built those nice cross-functional teams. Um, so this is really what we need to do in the data space as well. And when we look at what is really happening, or where the, where the development is going on, then we see that with this still centralized idea of a data platform, we see that on the source side of things, the amount of data and the heterogeneity of data is ever increasing because every service is producing data and there is more and more data around that is meant to be used. And on the other side of the consuming side, there is more and more pressure to do this build, measure, learn cycle, to work data-driven. So there's more pressure and more scale um, to produce and to use data. And of course, with this monolithic thing in the middle, this simply doesn't scale. So the conclusion here is that a hyper-specialized team building and operating centralized pipeline solutions that are oriented around technical functionality, this approach does not scale. And I felt it myself quite a few times being in those teams that it does not scale. So when we look back to this introduction about Thomas Kuhn, then we can basically say, doesn't this feel like we have been doing this or been stuck in this normal science phase for the last more than 40 years? Because basically we're just optimizing in, within the current boundaries of thinking. <clears throat> We're just changing technologies, but we do not change the actual setup of how things are working. <clears throat> so, where do we go from here? 
here I want to start introducing the data mesh concept and the data mesh principles. And um, I want to go through this by covering four topics individually. First, applying a domain-driven distributed architecture. Then, self-service infrastructure as a platform. Product thinking and ecosystem governance. And what is important is that the data science, uh, the, the data mesh paradigm is nothing that we just invented out of the blue. It's a synthesis of the best approaches that we have seen with our most progressive clients. So it is kind of people um, at many places are seeing those pains and are going in a similar direction. And this is really a synthesis of those developments. And also, in a certain way, it is just applying what we are already doing on the operational space to the um, analytical data architecture. So let's go into this. So first, domain-driven distributed architecture. Many of you will be the experts when it comes to, uh, to domain-driven um, design. And so when we look at this monolith and how we can break it apart, then we look, um, of course, for ownership for those domain boundaries. And um, of course, those domain boundaries, they go across this um, monolithic rectangle there, right? Um, so when we look at this, then we have different kinds of domains um, when it comes to, to data sets. On the one side, we have what we call source-oriented or native domain data sets. And so an example of this would be maybe orders in an e-commerce uh, system um, or maybe user interaction, typically web tracking, because those domains, they capture certain facts of reality, of the reality of the business. So for instance, the, the orders domain, there might be a checkout service that is actually generating the events of those orders, and those orders really exist at, as a reality of the business. And so you have things like uh, immutable events, um, historical snapshots, and so on. And in general, those domains, they do not, or those domain data sets, they do not change so often in its definition, right? Because they are just part of um, how the business works. Um, and on the other side, you have a different kind of um, domain data sets, and we call them consumer-oriented domain data sets. And they are being created specifically for a certain purpose. So often they are aggregations of some sort or projections, or they are being transformed to specifically fit for that purpose. One example might be kind of a holistical customer's um, domain where you come up with aggregated um, values like lifetime customer value for the company or kind of really things that need a bit more um, aggregation and, and protection here. Um, another example would be something like shopping rec recommendations, where you would uh, build some machine learning application um, that creates those recommendations, but they are also then new data points. And those domain data sets, they can change more frequently because they are created for a certain, certain purpose, and they can be recreated. So now you may wonder kind of where, where are the, where's the data pipeline now? Where did it go? Well, the data pipeline is really in all of those domain data sets. So we just distribute the ownership of those data pipelines and maybe the data pipelines in the source-oriented domain data sets, they might involve more data cleansing, more integrity checks, whereas the data pipelines on the right side, on the source-oriented domain data sets, they involve more aggregations, more machine learning modeling. But this is really where the, um, where the data pipelines went. So this is a bit of a change of perspective. So we're more talking about domain data sets now and less about um, data pipelines. 
So domains are really the first class concern here now when we apply, apply domain-driven distributed architecture. They are the top-level partitions. And data pipelines are second, are second class concern. They are basically an implementation detail. And um, we use this, we use this um, concept of an architectural quantum here. And an architectural quantum, it has been described in um, this evolutionary architecture book um, by a couple of my colleagues quite nicely as um, an architectural building block that has a high cohesion and can be deployed independently. And so this architectural quantum, it shifts from the pipeline as this building block to actually domain data sets as the building block to architect your data landscape. So then we come to product thinking, to applying product thinking. And that is a really equally important part of the data mesh concept. It means that we build those domain data sets as products, with a product mindset um, being applied. And that means we think of our consumers, right? We think kind of who are our consumers. Um, we make sure that our consumers know that we exist and we kind of advertise what the value is of our domain data product or domain data set as a product. And we may want to provide different ways to give the data to our consumers. So this is what we call um, polyglot data products. Maybe one of our consumers rather wants the data stream-based um, and the other one rather in a um, batch-based way where we push it to some, some bucket where it's um, updated nightly. That really depends on the, um, on the consumers. But this is really what this product thinking is about. We, we put ourselves in the, uh, in the shoes of the consumers and we built this product for our consumers. But we figured out kind of we need to set certain standards um, for when a date, domain data set can call themselves a data product, right? So we say kind of you're only a data product if you provide certain support for those things. And one of the most important things that we figured out needs to be supported is discoverability, right? A data product needs to be, you need to be able to find it. That's the most important thing. It needs to be addressable, so you need to be able to programmatically get data from it once you found it. It needs to be trustworthy, so it means it has to have published SLOs, um, service level objectives. And I mean, here again, if you think in the operational space, right, you would never uh, deploy a microservice to production without having the uptime and the SLOs defined for that, for that service. But apparently so far in the data space, that is really normal. Um, and this is really what is important to change when we introduce product thinking here. It needs to be self-describing and it needs to be interoperable. So basically, um, it needs to adhere to certain standards defined by um, some governance so that different data products can work together. And finally, of course, it needs to be secure. So those are the things that where a team building a data product needs to take ownership of. And then when we come to the team building such a data product, this team, when we apply product thinking, needs to be a cross-functional team. So we need someone who can build data infrastructure there, infrastructure engineer. Software developers, data engineers, of course, and then, and this is really, I think, the most important thing, it needs to have a domain data product owner. How many product owners do we have in the room? Raise of hands. Oh. One or two, not that many. Um, so pretty often when I came to a client and I saw kind of um, what is going wrong, one of the recommendations um, 
that, that uh, we concluded with was to introduce a domain data product owner. So someone who really has the role of making sure this data set is handled like a product, defines a roadmap for that data set, makes sure it is being advertised in the company, makes sure to, make, to, to talk to the users and um, get an understanding of, the, uh, of what those users wants, want. And this is really, um, this make, makes a major difference. Because this is to many people, when I come up with this recommendation, they, um, they, they really never came up with the idea at all. So it seems very new to them. Uh, because pretty often, when we look in the data space, we have tables and we have database and data engineers, and they, have owner they happen to have ownership of those tables. But they are not trained and often not inclined to think in a, in a product way. And it makes sense that we have this role of a product owner, right? And so it makes a lot of sense here as well. So uh, to conclude here is uh, we need to build domain data sets as a product. They need to be discoverable, interoperable, and so on. And we need to treat data consumers as customers. There needs to be a data product owner role, and it needs to be a cross-functional team ownership here. And so if we, can, if we want to define one, success criteria here for applying this, then it should be the lead time between discovering a data product and being able to consume it. So this is really what you need to optimize for, that this time becomes really short. Like We find a data product, we manage to make sense of it, and we can start consuming it and build something from it. So then we come to platform thinking. And Often when we introduce this concept of bringing those data pipelines in those cross-functional teams uh, built around domains, um, then we get the feedback like, are you crazy? This is going to duplicate all the efforts and we need to have those um, data engineering skills everywhere and where can we get all those people from? And this, of course, is where um, data infrastructure as a platform and platform thinking comes into place. So there needs to be a data infrastructure platform um, underpinning this. And it needs to be built by data infrastructure engineers. The important thing here is to build this data infrastructure platform basically as thin as possible and as domain agnostic as possible with lots of self-service tooling and so on. So very much compare it to the cloud platforms, right? Um, the cloud platforms are also entirely domain agnostic, provide a lot of self-service, and um, the, the cloud platforms were really what enabled DevOps to, to, to quite a large extent. And this is the same here. Here we can also enable this by a thin but powerful self-service uh, platform. And one of the things that, for instance, should is, is a good thing to be covered uh, by this platform is the discoverability to provide a, a global thing to um, register with to make your data product um, to be discovered. And so there's a long list of things um, that can be tackled by such a uh, data infrastructure platform. One of the things is that, that really makes a lot of sense to cover there is unified data access control because this can be a lot of pain if it's not handled um, or not supported centrally. And um, so you can take a lot of friction away when you manage to support this in a nice user-friendly way. And uh, un other things could be uh, supporting continuous delivery or, as I said, data product discoverability. So summarizing this is you need to have data infrastructure and tooling. Sometimes this is called data ops. It needs to be a shared self-service platform, domain agnostic, and owned by a data infrastructure tooling team. And it's important to not run into the trap and make this data infrastructure platform the big data platform that I talked about before, right? So you need to make sure that this is actually domain agnostic and it's not a data product by itself or kind of becomes, again, this, this big central thing which is blocking things. So it should really be about self-service and enablement. 
And if there's one success criteria to choose here, then it would be to the lead time to create new secure and discoverable data products. So basically measure the time, how long does it take for a team that wants to build a data product to spin that data product out, uh, up, um, come up with all the infrastructure. And so, yeah, fantastic things that I have seen are templates where you really um, can get to a data product scaffolding um, within a couple of uh, minutes or hours and then start building it. And I mean, we see this in the operational space a lot, right, with uh, uh, platforms that we built there. And then we come to the final piece, which is the ecosystem governance. So when we look at the success of the microservice architecture and how we applied microservices, then this whole thing only worked because there were a certain, there were certain standards, right? So HTTP and REST, for instance, um, are often used as the universal um, interface in one particular microservice system, and this makes sure that the services can uh, interact. So for one job for the federated and global ecosystem governance is to support and to push interoperability or enable it. This is really one of the main things that the global governance should do. And we should make sure that we know what the governance should do and what it shouldn't do to make sure, again, we, don't, we avoid a central blocking piece. The other thing, I mentioned this, it should enable discoverability, again, uh, by, by certain standards. And this can work very nicely with a data infrastructure platform because it's hard to push for standards without a good motivation for the individual teams to um, adhere to those standards. But a nice way to kind of sneak in those standards is by providing nice automation as part of a platform. So when you have a nice automated template or something and just solutions that makes it easier to use something that is already there in the platform, and that, by the way, also makes sure you, get, you adhere to the uh, global ecosystem governance standards, then even better. So you have an incentive to use the automated pieces and um, at the same time adhere to those standards. So this works nicely hand in hand. And then other things that can be done by this is um, policy enforcement, such as encryption, etc. So let's bring this all together. Really what we envision here is that the data mesh platform is intentionally designed as a distributed data architecture under a centralized governance and standardized for interoperability that enables kind of or that is enabled by a shared and harmonized self-service data infrastructure and what this is really all about is being distributed so this goes away from this centralized idea but it is about ownership right this is not about creating silos, kind of data silos that um, do not care about each other. This is about creating teams that own data products. And that means they have the responsibility and they want to create an impact with their data product. And kind of creating domain boundaries and creating an environment that enables ownership is really the main goal of, of this whole concept here. So where is, the, where is the data lake? Where is the data warehouse in this picture? Well, it is actually still there. So the, uh, there's still a good reason to have a data warehouse or even multiple data warehouses and a data lake around. It's just that they are now modules or part of the platform, but it's not what you talk about anymore, right? So this is not so much a shift of, I don't know, changing all of the infrastructure. This is a shift of perspective. So, and that's why we call it a paradigm shift. So we go from centralized ownership to decentralized ownership. We go from monolithic to distributed, from 
pipelines as the first class citizen to domain data sets as the first class citizen to from data as a byproduct product of something to data as the product and from siloed data engineering teams to cross-functional domain data teams that work together and have data engineering capabilities. And really what this is, and this is often what paradigm shifts come with, is kind of a new language, right? It changes the way you speak about this. So maybe let's talk less about ingesting, but more about serving, because you want to serve your customers. And let's not talk about extracting and loading so much, but more about discovering and consuming, because those are the things that should be happening. And maybe you, as a, uh, someone working on a data product, you can be both in the role of the server and the person or the, the team that is consuming data. So you're also a consumer yourself. And Let's talk less about flowing data through a pipeline, but about publishing data through ports. And let's not talk so much about a centralized data lake, a data warehouse, or a platform, but let's talk about an ecosystem of data products. And so what this all is about is to close this divide between the operational systems architecture and the big data analytical architecture and bring them together so that data really becomes the fabric of the organization. And Jamak has written a fantastic article about this, so it's really worth reading. Um, I wish I had written it myself. Uh, it really puts those things very nice with more detail <coughs> uh, into, into this frame. And, uh, maybe to sneak in something from myself here as well. I have written about um, continuous delivery for machine learning, which is also kind of connected with this, so um, you're happy to, you're welcome to look into this as well. And with this, I thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs>